Now, before I read the scripture, I want to make a statement that most of you will agree with. Some of you will not agree with it, but most of you will. Religion, religion is the most deadly enemy that Jesus Christ has or has ever had. Religion nailed Jesus to the cross. Now listen, lest you go out of here and say I'm a false prophet, I didn't say Christianity nailed Jesus to the cross. And I didn't say that Christianity is the greatest enemy that Jesus ever had. I said religion, and I'll never take it back. Religion nailed Jesus to the cross. And if Jesus should come to Greenville, South Carolina, if Jesus should come to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, or if Jesus should come to Baltimore, Maryland, or Washington, D.C., or New York City, or Chicago, and preach the sermons that he preached while he was here upon this earth, they'd nail him to the cross again. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, I want you to turn to the Sermon on the Mount. And, of course, the liberals enjoy preaching from the Sermon on the Mount. I heard a minister make the statement not so many mornings ago, I was traveling and he was speaking on morning devotions and he said that the need of this hour is for preachers to get back to the Sermon on the Mount. There's not one drop of blood in the Sermon on the Mount. Not a drop. Now, I didn't say the Sermon on the Mount is not the Word of God. The Sermon on the Mount is the Word of God, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But there is not one single solitary drop of blood in the Sermon on the Mount. And the message that this generation needs is the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Amen. Now in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now here's the text that I'm using tonight, and it's in Matthew 5, 20. For I say unto you, now, this is Jesus speaking. And if you're using a red-letter Bible or a Bible that has the words of Jesus in red, the words that I'm now reading are printed in red. And here's what it says. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that in your Bible? Say, huh? Now let me read it one more time. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness, that is, go beyond, be of better quality, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, Ye shall in no case, under no circumstances, in no wise, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you'll turn to John chapter 18, right quickly, please. John 18, of course, I don't have time to read it. But in John 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Kidron, where uh, there was a garden into which he entered, and his disciples, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, sent forth, uh, went forth, rather, and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Then said Jesus unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you 
I am he, therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword, and receive uh, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it. Now, if you'd just keep on going, right there, right on down, right straight on through chapter 18, and right on into chapter 19, you'll discover that the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, and the priests, they're the gang that demanded the death of Jesus and nailed him to the cross because he transgressed the tradition of the fathers. Now, I'm going to say something right here that some of you are not going to appreciate fully, but don't condemn me. Don't ever call any man out until you give him at least three strikes. Give him three strikes, will you? And don't condemn me, and don't say I don't like Oliver Green because you don't know whether you like me or not. If we were neighbors, you might like me. You may not like my preaching. You may not like what I say, but don't say I don't like the preacher, and don't say I don't believe what he's preaching until you weigh the statements, analyze the statements, compare them with the Word of God, and let God do a little talking to you, and then see if I'm right, or if you're right, and if I'm right and you're wrong, then believe me, because I'm preaching, thus saith the Lord God Almighty. Is that fair say, huh? Now I'm going to tell you a secret. The only reason some of you folks are Baptists is because your daddy was a Baptist. You don't a bit more than a monkey know what Baptists believe. All you know is they immersed you and that's it. And you think John the Baptist started the Baptist church. Well, you say, preacher, I thought you was a Baptist. I am. Well, I certainly wouldn't criticize them. I'm not. Neither do I brag on them. Too many I'm in the penitentiary. Amen. You'll find as many Baptists in the pen as non-Baptists. And you'll find some Methodists down there too. Amen. So don't you Methodists rear back and blow up. I don't want to have to deflate you. Amen. Just stay down where you belong. Some of you people seat, are seated in this tent right now. Some of you folks sitting there looking straight at me. You're a Baptist, a good Baptist, a full-fledged Baptist, and you don't know why you're a Baptist. Now, I can prove this. The man's still alive that gave me the offer. Shortly after I was converted, a certain denomination that I won't name that is nationwide and even has churches in England and other places told me shortly after I was saved, and I had a tent then, not near this big, but I had a tent. They said, Preacher, if you'll come to us and let us ordain you and let us send you out to organize churches, we'll pay you thus and so. And it was a handsome salary 25 years ago. And they said, we'll pay you all your expenses. We'll furnish your equipment. You'll have nothing to worry about. You just preach and organize churches and be our evangelist and we'll take care of you. Now, I appreciate that. And that's no slam on that group. I said the other night, God calls evangelists to organize churches. God calls preachers to organize churches. And that's, that's a wonderful ministry and a wonderful mission. And God calls men to do that. But, beloved, God didn't call me to do that. And I've been independent ever since God saved me. And I went to a little Baptist school. And I can prove this too. In the South, we have what they call the cooperative program. Ever heard tell of it? They cooperate as long as you do. And that's the reason I'm not a Southern Baptist today. I'm an independent Baptist. I'm not isolated. I'm independent, not isolated. We have some independent Baptists down south, so independent that the termites out of the sales of their church won't fellowship with termites out of another church. Amen. That's right. 
They fly in different coveys. I'm not isolated, but I'm independent. I'm not tied to anybody but Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, don't you misunderstand me. You should belong to a local church, and I'm not against organization. I'm for organization. Jesus believed in organization, but we've just about organized Christ out of it today, huh? Now, the reason I'm not a Southern Baptist, I went to a Baptist school when God saved me. I went three years. And when I filled out my ministerial application for cooperative program money, as a farmer boy, and if my neighbors had not given me a shower of shirts and handkerchiefs and socks, I wouldn't have had enough clothes to go to school, and God bears me record I lie not. And my neighbors gave me the clothes to go to school, and I went to school, and I filled out the application for ministerial aid. And on the application it said, Are you a premillennialist or a post? And I didn't have the most sense in to tell them I was a pre. And so I had to sweep halls to pay my way through school. And the other boys that said I'm a post got there as free. Now you may not believe that, friend, but I can prove that. And the president of that school, 29 years ago, is still alive. And because I said I believed in the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, they denied me cooperative program money that my family had been putting in the church for a hundred years. So I said, goodbye, Baptist. And I've been independent ever since. I don't belong to anything but Jesus Christ. Amen. Nobody tells me how to preach, when to preach, where to preach, what to preach, how long to preach. And if you don't like it, bless God, the same hole you came in is open. <coughs> Take off. Amen. Get moving. I'm not for sale. Now, let's get down to the message. I said the teaching of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the words that he uttered went against the grain, and they demanded his death. Now then, the thing that I want to see tonight I expect I'd better put it in reverse and back up just a little bit. Some of you Methodists are sitting out there looking right sanctimonious. And some of you Pentecostals, I saw you get about two inches higher just a minute ago like this. Some of you Pentecostals, bless God, you don't know why you're Pentecostal. The only reason you belong to the Pentecostal church is because your daddy and your granddaddy and your great-granddaddy were Pentecostal. That's the only reason in the world you belong to the Pentecostal church. Some of you Methodists, the only reason in this world, the only reason in the world that you're a Methodist, you were christened in the Methodist church when you was a baby and you couldn't help yourself. And that's the only reason you're Methodist. And the same is true of the Catholics. We've had two precious Catholic ladies saved here this week. Thank God. Amen. One of the folks stayed in the prayer room with one of those ladies night before last until I don't know why. They stayed an hour, hour and a half. But she came out of there beaming, smiling, praising God. And last Sunday night, a precious Catholic lady was saved in that prayer room back there. Amen. And there are Catholics here tonight, and you're welcome. God bless you, you're welcome. There are Roman Catholics here tonight, and you're just as welcome under this canvas as any Baptist. You're just as welcome under this canvas as any Methodist. You're just as welcome as any person under this canvas. But the only reason you're a Roman Catholic, you were brought up in a Roman Catholic home. That's the only reason you're a Catholic. Now, Jesus said, not Oliver Green, not the Baptists, not the Methodists, not the Catholics, but Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case, under no circumstances, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Is that right? Amen. Answer. Now, the thing I want us to do is see, turn to Matthew 6, if you will. I want us to see what kind, what species, what brand of righteousness 
the scribes and the Pharisees had. Back to the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6. And watch this. Take heed that you do, this is verse 1, Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of men, of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 6, 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets that they may have the glory of men. Verily I send you, they have their rewards. Is that in your Bible? Say, Amen. Now he said, don't sound a don't uh, sound a trumpet like the hypocrites do. Read on down. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what the right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their rewards. Is that in your Bible? They have it. That's what they're praying for. Read on. But thou, when thou prayest, enter the closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think they are heard for their much speaking. Is that right? Say, huh? Now then, here's what Jesus is pointing out. These people were faithful in almsgiving. They were faithful in praying. They were faithful in practicing the tradition of the fathers and the doctrines of the fathers. They were faithful in their religious activities, but they were so wrapped up in the church, in the, uh, the, uh, the kingdom or the coming kingdom, and the, they were so wrapped up in Judaism, and they were so wrapped up in the religion of their fathers that they totally and entirely missed their Messiah and it seems that it would, have been, it would have been impossible to miss him. He had so many labels on him. Everything he did, the place where he was born, the place where he lived, and every minute detail of his life was prophesied and spelled out in the Old Testament. Amen, answer me. But they missed him. In John, don't turn, please, but in John chapter 5, please don't turn because I'm not going there. I'm quoting, just listen. In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus said, Search the Scriptures, and then you think you have eternal life. Search the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life? I've told this before. I'll try to make it very brief, but, and I don't have any notes here. Uh, God knows I don't have it down here. Tell this. I don't. The Holy Spirit reminds me, and I think I should tell it. We were in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and a Jew man attended that meeting. We may have some Jews here tonight. God bless you. A Jew man attended that meeting and one Sunday night he was there. And I didn't know he was there. But this little Jewish lady knew he was there, and she prayed for him earnestly. And he didn't come up. He raised his hand for prayer, but he wouldn't come forward. And after the service, she persuaded him to come down and speak to me. And she said, this man's a Jew. And he's looking for his Messiah, and his Messiah has already come. And she literally backed him into the corner, and it was that one over there, this left-hand corner. She literally backed him into the corner where he couldn't budge and gave me the signal to stand on one side of him, and she got on the other, and if he'd got out, he'd had to run through us. Amen. And you know what that little woman did? I stood there and saw a miracle just as great as Barnabas' eyes being opened. I saw a miracle just as great as Lazarus being raised from the dead. You know what that little woman did? That little Jew woman took her Bible and she went to Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report, and she read the whole chapter. She asked that Jew, said, who's that talking about? He said, I don't know. She backed right up to the first verse and read the whole chapter again. She said to that Jew, who's that talking about? He said, frankly, I don't know. She backed right up to the first verse and she read it again. 
and she stood right there and read Isaiah 53 until it melted that Jew's heart and God saved him standing right in that corner. And it was the Word of God that did it. Amen. The Word of God. Now those Jews read Isaiah 53. They read Zechariah. They read Malachi. They read the Old Testament Scriptures. They searched the Scriptures. They memorized the Scriptures. They'd place them on their garments. But they searched the Scriptures in vain. They refused to face their Messiah and admit that He was their Messiah because He did not bow to their traditions. They were faithful in giving alms. Do you help the poor? I don't mean every Tom, Dick, and Harry that runs up and down the road begging. I'm talking about the poor folks in your community. I'm talking about the sick. Now listen, you look up here at Oliver Green. The Church of the Living God has allowed the Kiwanis Club and the Red Cross and the lions and the tigers and the bears and the owls and some of the rest of them, God bless you. Now, that's no reflection on you fellas. The Church of the Living God has allowed the Kiwanis and the Lions Club and the, uh, what, what's this they call it? Uh, uh, what do they have ever, ever, ever? Uh, United Fund. What is, what's it called that? United Fund. Listen, the United Fund, the United Fund should be handled by God's people in God's church, feed the hungry, call the naked, help the destitute, and while you're feeding them, win them to Jesus. Amen. The best time in the world to preach the gospel to a sinner is catch him while he's hungry, feed him, and then tell him about the bread of life. But no, we've let the, we've let the secular organizations take it over, bless God, when back in the first church, they had no deacons until the widows and the orphans were being neglected and they elected a board of deacons and Stephen was the first deacon and they elected those deacons to take care of the widows and the orphans and the needy so God's preachers could study and pray and win souls. Is that right? Say, huh? Some of you deacons thought you were appointed to hire and fire preachers, didn't you? Of course, the Baptist church has two classes, deacons and dickenses. Amen. So, preacher, who are you talking about? I don't know. If your phone's ringing, answer it. I just dial the numbers. But I want to serve notice on the deacons, the stewards, the elders. I want to serve notice on you that God Almighty didn't call you and appoint you and put you in the church to elect preachers and run preachers and run churches. Your job is to take care of the needy in the community and watch after the widows and the orphans and take all you can off of your pastor, bless God, so he can study and pray and preach the word. Amen. Some of you look like deacons now. You may not be, but you have that deaconish look. Amen. You sure do. Now, and I'm going to say this. I might as well go ahead and nail this down while I'm nailing. Because this is the last time I'll get to nail some of you. I can tell that now by looking at you. So I just well go ahead and nail it down. You go to church on Sunday morning, and the dear pastor comes out and he sits down and crosses his legs, and you lean over and say to your wife, he looks like he's about dead. Well, he is. And he gets through ringing doorbells, blast God, and petting big toes, and skinting knees, and, and uh, the lame, and petting, God bless you, a bunch of babies uh, that are on bottles when they should be eating ham in the church, and when the poor preacher gets through running, 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 and visiting and visiting to try to keep peace, he is wore out. He's not fit to study. He's so physically tired, he's not able to preach. 
Why don't you let your past alone bless God and grow up and stop being a baby? Amen. Say, preacher, I don't like you. The devil don't either. They were faithful in giving. They were faithful in praying. Turn to Matthew 12. I want to show you something about these folks. Now, Jesus said they weren't saved. Jesus said they were going to hell. He said, your righteousness must be of a better brand, quality, exceed, go beyond. Matthew 12, 1, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and hungered. They were hungry. He began to pluck the corn, the ears of corn, and eat. Matthew 12, 2, but when the Pharisees saw it, not the bootleggers. I don't have any trouble with bootleggers. Bootleggers have never bothered me. Never. I haven't had any report where any bootlegger in Chambersburg or Fedville told his customers not to come out here. But I can give you the name of a pastor that announced from his pulpit for his sheep to stay away from here. I don't blame him. If I preached what he did, I'd tell my sheep to stay away too. <laughs> Say, why don't you call his name? I wouldn't do it for a thousand dollars. I don't advertise such a fella. Now, let me tell you something. I've had no opposition from the bootleggers, the dopers, the poker players. They don't bother me. They never have. Now, don't misunderstand me. Now, I... You say, Preacher, why don't you go back to Greenville, South Carolina? I will, and I get through. I love the people of Chambersburg. The people of Chambersburg didn't put me off the radio. If the people of Chambersburg had put me off the radio, I wouldn't be on now. Is that good sense or not, say, huh? All, I want, all I'm saying, it, it wasn't, it, it, listen, the bootleggers didn't ask the, the station to put us off. The bootleggers didn't do it. The liquor stores didn't do it. The beer stores didn't do it. The poker players didn't do it. Religion demanded it. And that's the only station I've ever been put off of in 27 solid years. And I'm on some of the oldest stations in the United States. I'm on WRVA Richmond, Virginia, 50,000 watts, one of the oldest stations in America. And one of the most dignified. But they've been carrying my program for more than 15 years daily. Now, religion will crucify you if you'll give them a chance. Amen. Now, let's move up here. All right. So read on now. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him, how that he entered the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Or have ye not read in the law how uh, that... Uh, on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Is that right? Amen. Say, huh? Now then, let me back up just a minute and say a few words about this, and then we'll move because time is slipping and move I must. Now, they were sticklers for keeping the Sabbath. When Jesus and his disciples walked through the cornfield or the wheat field, and they pulled the corn and they ate the corn because they were hungry, the priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day condemned him for eating corn or plucking the corn on the Sabbath day. Now, they believed in keeping the Sabbath. They believed in giving. They believed in praying. They believed in making long prayers. They studied the Scriptures. They searched the Scriptures. Now, I don't think there is any verse anywhere 
that describes these people any better than Luke 18. Will you turn to Luke chapter 18, please? And remember the subject. Folks who are tagged for hell. And I want to serve notice on you. I want you to find it first because I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. When Jesus Christ gave the parable in Luke 14 of the Jew and the kingdom and the great feast, when he sent his servant out on the highways and hedges and said, Compel the halt and the maimed and the blind and the withered, he said, Compel and come in, that my house may be filled. He said, For I say unto you that not one of those men who were invited to my supper shall taste of my supper. Is that right? Is that correct? Say Listen, when God says Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone, mister, you're sunk. And when you're married to religion, married to a denomination, married to a cult, and turn a deaf ear to the truth of God, and God says to the Holy Ghost, let him alone, you'll go to hell just as sure as that pole's red. Now let's see what happens here. In Luke 18 and verse 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. We have some of those folks still around, you know that? There's a lot of folks who won't drink a Coca-Cola or drink a seven up. Do you know that? A lot of folks won't drink coffee, drink iced tea. A lot of folks won't wear a diamond, but they'll wear cufflinks and a tie clasp. Say, preacher, would you wear a diamond? If you've got one big as a gallon bucket, bring it to me. I won't wear it, but I'll put a dog chain on it and lead it. Amen. I sure will. <laughs> You see, where I'm going to, God decorates walls with them, and I want to get accustomed to the sparkle. I don't want it to be too hard on my eyes for the first million years. You got any old used diamonds around the house you don't need, bring them to me. I'll take them off your hands, amen. Now, there are a lot of people that strain out gnats and swallow camels, Amen. Now let's see what happens here. He spake this parable unto a certain man, or certain which trusted themselves, they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now that's publican Democrats, not Republican, just plain publican. <laughs> Goldwater wasn't alive when this was written. And we'll say more about that tomorrow night. Say, you must be a Republican. No, I'm Baptist. <laughs> One, a Pharisee, and the other, a publican, tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Watch this now. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing far off would not so much would not lift up so much as his eyes under heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, "God be merciful to me a sinner." Seven words: God one, B two, merciful three, two four, me five, A six, sinner seven. Seven words: God be merciful to me a sinner. And I tell you that I tell you, this man went down to his house. What say it? justified and to be justified is to be just as just as Jesus is just and to stand before God just as though you'd never committed a sin that's what justification is amen 
This man went to his house justified rather than the other, for every one that exalted himself should be abased, and he that humbled himself should be exalted. Now let's back up and see what this fellow did, and then uh, we'll analyze this, and, and we'll wrap this message up, and I'll show you what I've been trying to tell you all night. Now here it is. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a religionist, a religious leader, and the other was a publican, a tax collector, one of the most hated, despised, one of the most detested, one of the most deplorable men of his day, a tax collector, a publican. And the Pharisee went in the temple, and he stood, and he prayed. He stood. And he said, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And he was so afraid the Lord wouldn't fully understand and know just how good he was, he spelled it out. And folks still preach sermons in prayers. That must have been a preacher. You call on some folks to pray on Sunday morning, I'll guarantee you if the pastor has a 30-minute sermon, you'll be late getting out of church. Because some people, when they pray, they get other folks told in their prayers. I like the old fellow that belonged to this church, and you've heard this, it's as, it's as old as Noah's Ark, and he was, uh, he was one of these fellows that never did anything wrong. Everybody in the church was wrong. He knew how to run and how it ought to be run, and he was the best fellow in that. Everybody else, something was wrong with him. And so the pastor wanted to really nail him down and get him told, and every time he'd preach a sermon directly at him, he'd be the first one up to tell him how much he enjoyed it. So it was up here in these mountains. I wouldn't say it was these right here, but it was in the mountains. And it snowed that Sunday morning so deep that you couldn't manipulate it all. And so the pastor said, I've never missed my service, and I'm going to be there. So he left his son up, and he got to the church. And he got to the church just before 11 o'clock, and just as he rounded the bend where he could see the church, he didn't expect to find a soul, but he saw smoke coming out of the chimney. So he said, there must be somebody there. And he went through the snow almost waist deep and he opened the door and there sat that fella. Down under his breath he said, Hallelujah, I'll skin him today. Amen, I'll get him now. He's the only fella there. And so the preacher ran back and took a text and preached an hour and 30 minutes and he called him everything in the book and some things that wasn't in the book and he told him exactly what he was and he laid it on the line and he kept on nailing and hammering and he gave an invitation. Of course he didn't come and then the preacher pronounced the benediction, and the old fellow rushed up and grabbed him by the hand and said, Reverend, I sure wish they'd have been here. You sure would have got them told. Amen. <laughs> now, he's dead and gone, but he has some relatives. Amen. They're not dead. Some folks, you, they, they won't listen. Everybody else, in, in other words, the preacher's preaching to everybody but them. Do you have any of those folks up here say, do you? Now, this fellow was so afraid that the Lord wouldn't give him credit that he spelled it out. He said, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. And then he goes on to say, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners. I'm not an extortioner. Unjust, I give 16 ounces to the pound. I give 36 inches to the yard. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm a one man, a, fa a family man, one wife, no adultery, I'm clean, and I'm not even guilty of the things this publican does. What about you? How are you getting along? How are you getting along so far? Do you measure up to his standards so far? Do you... Can you say, I've never taken anything by extortion, I'm not unjust, I've always dealt justly, and I've, I've always been uh, clean, I'm not guilty of adultery, fornication, I'm, I'm a clean man, I, I'm, I'm clean. Can you say that? This man did. And Jesus didn't say he's a liar. Now watch it. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. How long has it been since you missed a meal for Jesus? Hmm? Hmm? Some churches, they can't even have a Sunday school meeting without feeding them. I'm not against eating. 
I'm not against fellowship. I'm not against feeding them. I'm not against it. I'm not against it. But, mister, when you put food against the Spirit, and when you put food uh, uh, ahead of the Spirit, when you put food ahead of the Word of God, and when you're more interested in feeding your stomach than you are feeding your soul, that's wrong! And you're going to need something stronger than a hot dog smothered in onions to get your young folks back to church. Amen. And we're trying to get them back to church with a hot dog smothered onions. We're trying to get them back to church with a ping pong table. We're trying to get them back to church with a basketball court and a softball bat. We need a revival that'll get the teenagers saved and they'll come back to church. Amen. Say amen. I'm not against recreation in its place. It ought to be. Now, I fast two times a week. Do you do that? How long has it been since you missed a meal? To pray. Some of you on Sunday morning, God bless you. If the dear pastor, if he's got a, if he's in the spirit and God's blessing, he's preaching and it gets up about two minutes till twelve, and then it gets up about a minute till twelve, boy, you'll see them slipping their sleeves. Amen. Slipping their sleeves. When I'm preaching on Sunday morning, I see some bird slip his sleeve up. I say, excuse me, Lord, I'm going to preach 15 more minutes just for him. Amen. <laughs> I'd rather you'd pull a 45 pistol on me in a watch when I'm preaching. Amen. It won't even miss dinner. It won't even miss lunch. Fast two times a week. Now, here is the real heartbreak the church of the living God operates the cheapest I don't like that word but I want it to sound flat not economically that's not it it's cheap cheap a dance hall bless God comes to town builds a nice dance hall and calls the asphalt people and pours an asphalt driveway and parking lot amen and some is a God's dear preacher comes to town, tries to build a church, and he builds a church, but you got to slide in, slide out in the mud for about seven years till you can get a little money to buy a little gravel. Amen. Answer me, say. And the reason the church is filled up with tight wads, skin flints, and penny pinchers. Some of you Baptists, when you get a penny, if you do drop a penny in the plate, just squeeze old Abe till you put a permanent wave in his beard. Amen. That's right. <laughs> And then you drop him in right slowly and saying, God be with you till we meet again. <laughs> you can't even be a first class, full fledged, up to date hypocrite until you start tithing. Every hypocrite in the Bible was a tithe. Well, you say, I thought he'd get around on that money business. I'm not on money business. If you put anything in these buckets tonight and you want it out, see the ushers. They'll give it back. Just tell them what you put in. You can get it. I mean it. That's not sarcasm. If you're sorry you put your money in, ask for it. We'll give it back to you. I mean it. I'm not preaching on money, but I'm going to tell you something. When you get right with God, when God Almighty gets in your heart, when you lay your life on God's altar, God will get in your pocketbook. Yes, He will. Amen. And you won't have to have a slab of fish, bless God, to buy a fish supper to help build the church. If you love God, you'll give a donation to the church without some fish on the side. Amen. Now, if you want to get the daylight skin out of it, let me tell you what you do. This winter, when the churches start advertising all over the country, oyster soup suppers, if you want to get the daylight skin out of it, you go and buy a bowl of soup and you get a bowl of Blue John with one little half-grown oyster swimming around saying, where's my wandering brother tonight? Amen. That's what you <laughs> If you want a bowl of oyster stew, go down here to a Greek restaurant, bless God, and pay for it, and he'll feed you. Amen. Say amen! amen. Or go home. Doesn't make much difference to me. If you don't like it, bless God, hit the hay. Amen. Just take off. God pity a bunch of tight wads, skin flints, penny pinches, soup sippers, and fish eaters that won't give God a dime without getting fed. So 
Now, I'll never come back to you on that bird again. I was afraid you wasn't, but I'm going to cut your horns off while I got you. Amen. I'll dehorn you one time. Some of you sit out there and me, bless God, and look right sanctimonious like you think I'm a fool and you're a saint. I'm not a fool and you're not a saint either. You need to be told. You need. If you made a hundred dollars this week and you don't give the Lord ten dollars of it tomorrow morning, you're not as religious as the Pharisee that Jesus said will go to hell. You haven't got as much religion as this boy's got. Now face it. Amen? Say, face it. No use to get mad, Oliver Green. You don't know me. Not me you don't like. It's what I'm pushing at you. Amen. That's what you don't like. Now, so he said, I tithe everything I possess. Do you do that? Well, you say, Brother Green, I don't believe in tithing. You say, tithing is law. Well, it's a funny thing that Jesus said when the Pharisees said we tithe, when he said you tithe mint and anise and cumin and, and you do all these things, and he said these things you should have done, but you shouldn't have left the weightier matters undone, right? Huh? And if you want to know the truth of the whole matter, the New Testament teaches more than tithe. The New Testament says, upon the first day of the week, that every man lay by him in store as God has prospered him. If you're a businessman and you make a hundred this week, maybe you can't spare but ten. But if God gives you a super week next week and you make three hundred, you shouldn't give thirty, you should give a hundred. Not ten percent, but thirty-three and a third, amen. And then if you do that the next week, God might let you make a thousand. But the reason God can't bless most of his children, he can't trust you. God don't want to make a thief out of you, so he just keeps you poor. Now, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case, under no circumstance, in no wise, Enter into the kingdom of God. They tithe, they pray, they give, they fast, they don't commit adultery, they're not, a, they're not extortioners, they're not unjust. Turn to Matthew 7. Now, I was informed last night by a precious, well meaning Christian lady that I misinterpreted this scripture that I'm about to read now. But I'm going to read it again tonight, nevertheless. And that's no, that's, I, 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 the sister, God bless her, we didn't have any fuss. We didn't argue. She just told me that I misinterpreted, and I just told her that I didn't, that was the end of it. So you think you're smart, don't you? No, I don't think I'm smart, but Mr. When God Almighty convicts me I'm right, I'd drop dead before I'd compromise with you. You're not going to tell me how to interpret this book. God called me to preach, and I preach for Jesus, not you. I preach for Jesus and not the Baptist. Now, I want you to see this, and if this don't break your heart, then I, I, I don't know if this don't make you think. And I don't know anything else to read, so I won't read anything else. This is all. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, or heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, I'm going to show you. Turn to John 6, right quick. John 6, right quick now. And I'll show you what the will of God is, then we'll go back to our scripture. John 6. I was looking for another scripture, but I don't suppose the Lord, I don't suppose the Lord wants me to read it. Right here. Yeah, I'll read it. Here it is, right here. Now I'm gonna read this other one first. Look at John 6. I was looking for another one. That's the reason I was hesitating. Here's the one I want you to look at now. John 6 40. Well, well, yeah, 640. That's all right. Save time. 
John 6 and verse 40, and this is the what? Will of him that sent me. Now, who sent Jesus? God the Father. So, he that doeth the will of my Father. And this is the will of him that sent me. So, this is the will of the Father. That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Now, is that in your Bible? Amen. Say it. So, it's the will of God the Father that you believe on the Son. Now then, in the same chapter, and here's what I was looking for. I didn't intend to read it, but I felt in my mind and heart that I should, and I was looking for it, and I couldn't find it, but I found it, so I'm going to read it to you. Uh, In verse uh, 27, same chapter, verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they, the Pharisees, if you'll read right back up ahead, you'll see it's the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes, elders, chief priests. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now that's the question. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom God hath sent. Is that in your Bible? Say, huh? So you see, the will of God is to believe on Jesus. The work of God is to believe on Jesus. The only way you can please God, see God, the only way God will accept you, the only way that God will accept you is to accept you in Jesus Christ. You believe that? Say. Now back to Matthew 7 and we'll close. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So it's the will of God that you believe on Jesus. Now, many, many, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name we have cast out devils. Is that right? Say, huh? Now you saw the green. You mean stand up and advertise your stupid ignorance and tell me that a sinner can cast out a devil? No, I don't mean to stand up here and advertise my stupid ignorance and tell you that a sinner can cast out a devil. These men didn't say he cast out the devil. They said we did it in Jesus' name. And that gang in Matthew 12, they said, He is casting out devils for the prince of the devils, Beelzebub. And Jesus said, If a kingdom is divided, it will fall. But that's another subject, altogether another subject. These men didn't claim to cast out the demons in their power. They didn't claim to cast out demons in their name. They said, We've done it in Jesus' name. Now watch this closely, please. Look this way, will you please? We've prophesied. That means to foretell or foretell. I'm a prophet. I'm not a prophet in that God reveals the future to me. I'm a prophet foretelling what the prophets foretold. Look it up in Webster. That's what we have that thing for. They do some Americans good to use it once in a while. A prophet is not just a man that predicts a war in 1975 and it happens. A prophet is a man that foretells what has been foretold. Every Sunday school teacher is a prophet. And there are ministers in the pulpits of of America and there are evangelists in the pulpits of America and there are Bible class teachers standing before men's classes and women's classes in America teaching the word of God and the teacher and the preacher and the evangelist has never been saved. Now Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11 he said Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light and there's no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Is that right? Say, is that right? Huh? 
So everything that wears a scissor tail coat and his collar backwards is not a preacher of the gospel. Amen. And every man that announces a DD and a PhD is not necessarily a born again man of God. Now, it's not Oliver Green that cast out the demons. It's not the man that cast out the demons. It's the Word of God that cast out the demons. And the Word of God will not return void. Amen, answer me, sir. So these men said, we've done many wonderful... We've prophesied in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. And we've done many wonderful works. We've built churches. We've raised thousands. We've supported radio preachers. We've supported missions. We've bought buses. We've uh, bought pianos. We've bought organs. We've done many wonderful works. And we did the work in the name of Jesus. They preached. They cast out demons. And they worked in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Amen, say I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The churches of this fair land are the free and the home of the brave. The churches of the United States, the churches of Greenville, South Carolina, are bulging at the seams and there's hardly a church in Greenville County that doesn't have a building program. But there's more adultery, more divorce, more fornication, more illeg illegitimate babies, more liquor drunk, more beer drunk, more wine, more murder, more killing. You can believe this if you want to. It doesn't make difference whether you believe it or not. They built a brand new courthouse in Greenville about seven or eight years ago. They had to double the thing to try the murder cases in Greenville, South Carolina. And Mr. There's never a Monday that you pick up the Greenville News that there isn't one or two or three and sometimes as high as five murders in the city of Greenville. And Greenville is a little town. Murder, adultery, fornication, rape, uh, divorce, and illegitimate babies, and dope, and liquor, and everything else, brother, is on the rampage, and the churches are knocking out walls and big, they're building bigger walls. Why? We've got a revival. We have a revival! We have a revival in America of church joining. You can get in the average Baptist church and stay in it a lot easier than you can get in the Masons. You can get in the average Baptist church and stay in it easier than you can get in the Koalas Club. But you can't get in the kingdom of God unless you're washed in the blood. Amen. Thousands of Americans will go to church tomorrow morning, rise and sit and stoop and bow and sing and quote and kiss God goodbye to the lakes, the rivers, the ballparks, the dance halls, the nightclubs. Goodbye, God. Till next Sunday morning. And they put on their Sunday duds and they go back again. And they sing and rise and sit and stoop and bow and quote and sing and tip the Lord. Tip the Lord. Put in a little piece of silver and rear back and sing, Rescue the Pershing and care for the dying. Amen. Thousands of Baptists, thousands of Methodists, thousands of Presbyterians, thousands of Pentecostals, thousands of Catholics, thousands of Episcopalians, church members, religious, but lost. How many people in this tent do not belong to any church anywhere? Stand. Stand, folks. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Just want to see. Stand. You don't belong to any church anywhere. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 16, 17, 20, 
two, four, six, thirty. You may be seated. Thirty. I don't know how many folks we have tonight. Evangelistically speaking, we have ten thousand. If I told the truth, I guess we have about eight hundred. But thirty. Thirty people here tonight out of this mob. Thirty. That's not a member of the church. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I want you to respond just like you'd raise your hand if I put up one of these beautiful red Bibles and said, Who wants it? And you'd want it and you'd raise your hand. I want you to respond just like a light comes on when you push the, when you push the switch. I want you to respond instantaneously because you can. I asked all the non-church members to stand. These folks stood. They, they didn't wait around. They stood. They know. Now I'm going to ask you one. How many of you folks remember sometime, somewhere, not a date, not a day, not a date, not a month, not a week, not a year, but you remember a specific time, not a date, not September the 1st, 1924, 34, 44, 54, or 64. You don't remember a date, but you remember a specific time when you had a definite experience and you trusted Jesus and Jesus saved you and you know you're saved. Raise your hand high. Take it down. Did you raise yours? Did you raise your hand? If you didn't, why didn't you? You know why you didn't? Your heart wouldn't let you. You know what Jesus said about you? I'm going to let him tell you. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let him tell you. Let me borrow your Bible. I preached it out of this one. There's a lot of pages going out of these books. Here it is. Right here. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before God. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and God knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. You know why you didn't raise your hand? Your heart wouldn't let you raise your hand. That's why you didn't raise it. In the morning at 15 minutes till 3 o'clock, if somebody should come, if your wife, I won't say somebody, if your wife or your mother or your daddy or your sister or your brother or your child, if they should come to your bedside and you're fast asleep tomorrow morning at 10 minutes after 3 and take you by the shoulders and shake you and say, Daddy, are you saved? You should sit up in bed and you should automatically sit up in bed and say, Yes, I'm born again. You won't gradually sit up and rub your eyes and say, I hope so, think so, doing the best I can. I'm a Baptist. I asked a fellow in Danville the other Sunday, I said, are you saved, sir? He said, I'm a Baptist. I said, well, that's all right. I, I don't think God will hold that against you. Come on. That's what I was, and he saved me. Amen. Let's come on. Let's get saved. I'm glad God can save Baptists. Do you know you're saved as good as you know you're breathing? Huh? You say, preacher, I don't believe anybody knows it. Doesn't make difference what you believe. This book got here before you did. And John said, We know we've passed death and life. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. The blind boy said, Whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I can't answer that. But there's one thing I can tell you I was blind, and now I see. Amen. Amen. 